Well, welcome to the Midlands Men's Convention. My name's Leo Davis, and I'm the, the chair of the planning team, and it is a delight to welcome you here. It is wonderful uh, over the years as uh, we've been running this to see familiar faces. Uh, I see the names on the sign-ups as they come through, and see your faces now. It's great to have you, you back, and uh, it's encouraging that you, you think it's worthwhile coming back we, uh, year on year. And, uh, but also, it's encouraging to see new faces and new churches represented as well. So uh, thank you for coming. I hope you are really blessed and encouraged by the day. We always say one of the blessings of a day like this, uh, and one of the things we really aim to encourage as a planning team, uh, is relationships with one another. It's great to be together as men uh, across churches, and so do make the most of that opportunity over this, uh, this conference. Don't just stay in your, the group you came with. It's great to, to, to have time with them, but also do say hello uh, to others uh, as well. We think the kind of the coffee times are as valuable as uh, the sessions themselves. So make the most of them. And particularly this year, we're, we're thinking about conversations that serve Christ, and so it'd be great for that to be happening throughout the day. It might be that there is a particular conversation uh, that you feel you need to have uh, today. You may be prompted by uh, something that's said, uh, maybe something on your mind or on your conscience. Well, make the most of the opportunities you have today. With a bit more space, uh, with guys that you can trust, or maybe uh, someone who doesn't know your context, uh, do uh, have those conversations. Make the most of the day. But as we begin, let me commit uh, the whole day to the Lord as we come to speak to him in prayer. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he has lavished on us. Father, we want to praise you for the blessings that you have lavished upon us, how precious they are. We are not worthy of a single one, but we marvel that you have chosen us and that you have brought us into a relationship with you, adopting us as your children and that you have redeemed us in your son according to your grace thank you that you delight to speak to us and that have given us your word so that we can know you and enjoy you as our father and we thank you for one another too for the gift of others that we can share your blessings with and so please be gracious to us today. Would you be at work by your spirit through every aspect as we sing of the gospel, as we, we speak, as you speak to us in your word, as we chat over coffee. Use every part to grow us as your people. Make us more like your son and ultimately give you the glory and praise and honour that you alone deserve. For your glory we ask it. Amen. Well, thank you, uh, uh, to our band. Uh, we work them hard at conference because we do really uh, value the opportunity to sing uh, as men. So I'm going to hand over to them as we lift our voices to the Lord in song.
Well, it's great uh, to welcome Steve, uh, Steve Midgley, our uh, main speaker for today. Uh, Steve and I um, uh, did the biblical counselling course over over Zoom uh, together, and uh, oh, sort of. Um, so I've been very blessed by all your ministry, Steve, through that. Um, just tell us a little bit about uh, yeah your family and uh, your sort of primary ministry to them. Tell us tell us who, who they are and where they are. <coughs> Thank you, Leah. Lovely lovely to be with you. Thank you for the invitation. Um, so I I live in Cambridge, and um, uh, Beth, my wife. Uh, and I have three adult children, um, and they, they've all moved away in different ways. Uh, the t- two eldest are married, um, so I've moved into the grandparent era, which um, takes me by surprise, um, uh, but it's lovely. Um, and then our youngest daughter, I'll, uh, yeah, um, our youngest daughter has uh, profound learning difficulties, so um, she's nonverbal, um, which is uh, interesting, thinking mm-hmm. about words and talking. Mm. Yeah, um, and uh, so she's got a, a different life ahead of her. Great, and so that's that's one ministry. You you are, you've got several other ministries as well. You're the assistant minister of Christ Church in Cambridge, uh, and also the executive director, if I got your title right, for Biblical Council UK. Just just tell us. So three very different ministries. Just tell us about the the what's what's the joy for each of those? What do you sort of uh, rejoice in? Thank God for for those different ministries. Gosh, um, lot, lots could say there. So, um, I'll send to Leah. It went through a bit of a transition uh, just coming up to a couple of years ago. Uh, so, I had been the senior pastor of, um, uh, of Christ Church in Cambridge for nearly 20 years. Um, but during, during, during that time, um, the, my involvement in, in this area of biblical counselling, which will be very unfamiliar to many, I guess, as a phrase, um, uh, that had grown. Uh, biblical counseling is, is a thing that is, is much bigger in the United States, uh, been a big implant on the church there over f- sort of 50, 60 years, but very little prominence in the UK. Um, and uh, how would I capture it? I mean, in a sense, it is it's, in, in lots of ways tied in with the topic we're thinking about today. How do we give good counsel, whether that's in a conversation um, or whether that's in, in more formal ministry settings? Um, how do we give good counsel, biblical counsel? Um, how do we speak well um, into, um, into all of the contexts uh, that we're placed? Um, and uh, biblical counseling seeks to, to help churches to do that. I'm not really answering your question. So let me backtrack. Um, uh, the, um, it's, it's very exciting family. It's very exciting being a granddad. Um, and thinking, you know, it takes you back to, to when your own children were small and, and you think, um, how lovely to have another chance to be involved in, in the, yeah, exactly. Um, learn from, <laughs> le- yeah, learn from your own experience and think, you know, to, to support your children as they, as they take that process forward. So that's lovely. Um, church is, um, it wasn't easy stepping aside from being senior pastor. Um, I, I, I'm thrilled that it didn't mean me moving away. Uh, because of the way that we we restructured and a colleague stepped into being becoming uh, the vicar, I was able to to stay. It's a it's a small role there, because um, but it's but it's lovely. I, I love love our church. Love being a part of it, um, b- because the the role with biblical counselling has become the sort of the biggest part of my week. Um, what, what do I love about that? I, I love all the opportunities to encourage people to, to use words well um, and to, to, to seek to make sure they're Christ-centered and Christ-serving um, words. And just, just tell us a, a little bit about that. So you've got a slide on the board about the Civicore course, which, so yeah, how can we, how can we learn about biblical counseling? So as, as an organization, we're, we're, not, we're not sort of... Um, we're not sort of providers of, of, of counselling in any sense. Um, much more as an organisation, we're, we're equipping and training. So um, a, lot of, a lot of visits to churches, helping them think about um, uh, church life. A lot of it is, is, is cultural shift. Um, moving, you know, helping, helping think, what does it look like for a church to, to become a church that speaks um, more honestly, and in a more engaged and more Christ-centered way to one another. Um, you know, getting past the sort of, you know, hi, how are you, fine, yeah, good, I'm fine, you're fine, we're all fine, good, let's, let's all be fine. Yeah, to, to get past that and actually 
you know, when somebody asks you how you are, to, to provide an honest answer um, in an appropriate kind of way um, so that the culture of our churches begin to change and we speak, um, uh, we speak with, with growing and deeper friendships um, centered around Christ. Um, so, yeah, tra- training and equipping in churches, um, training and equipping individuals as well. So the, the certificate course, which is up on the, is the main thing that we do, um, which is a, a you know, sort of a number of modules spread over three years um, that people take sometimes in, in a local venue, um, sometimes online, um, and helping people with the development of of good conversations right from the simplest um, all the way through to, to, to the more complex and skilled uh, with people who are struggling with, with more difficult things in their life. Great. Well, thank you so much, Steve. Uh, op- lots of opportunity if you want to find out more to ask Steve about that throughout the day. Um, and he'll also be able to point out a number of people I know in this room who've also done that, done that course as well, who you can um, speak to as well. Uh, but thank you. We're going to sing again, uh, and then we're going to hear from God's word, and then Steve will come and speak to us.
Okay. We will be reading from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 16. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. By, complete, by completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is, there is in one body and one spirit, just as you were called unto hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and one Father of all, who is over all, true, all, and in all. But to teach one another of grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captive and gave gifts to his people. Why does he ascend mean? What does he ascend mean? Except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions. He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faiths and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attending to the whole measure of the faithfulness of Christ, then we will no longer be infants, infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching or by the cunning and craftiness of the people in their deceitful scheme, scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every aspect mature bodies of him who is the head that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Thank you very much, Ebenezer, for reading for us. And thank you again for the invitation to, to come and speak. Um, it, it is a great topic, isn't it? To, to think about our, our words, uh, to think how uh, we speak. Um, and uh, I've enjoyed uh, wrestling with it and, and puzzling uh, over how to go about this topic um, in a couple, of, a couple of sessions today. Um, but, we're thinking about the, the words that we say, the words that we hear, the words that fill up our marriages, our churches, our friendships, uh, our workplaces. Uh, there are a lot of them. Um, it's been calculated, I don't know who counted them, but it's been calculated that um, each of us speaks uh, 10 or 20,000 words a day. It's a lot of words. Uh, and we get to choose every single one of them. It's not just the volume of, of words that we speak that makes this so important for us to think about. Uh, there are some pretty big theological uh, underpinnings to the issue of words and language, isn't there? Uh, not least the way that God uses words. At the very beginning, God spoke creation into being. God said, let there be light, and there was light. A series of words uh, that brought everything that is uh, into existence. Uh, and then God directs his people with a word. Speaks to Adam and Eve that they might know his will for them. Uh, and uh, later does exactly the same thing uh, with the Ten Commandments. Literally, they are the ten words, the Decalogue. 
uh, as he directs uh, what the nation of Israel uh, are to be shaped by. Uh, even tells his people uh, that they cannot live by bread alone, but they live on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Uh, words that Jesus himself uses uh, in response to the temptations of the devil uh, in Matthew chapter 4. And, and of course, ultimately, the, the very clearest indication of the importance of the word is found in the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, for the one that God sends is nothing less than the word of God, the word made flesh, an embodied word. Uh, and those who come to Christ, those who are given the task of speaking for Christ, uh, become stewards of this word, speaking the very words of God. You can't fail to see when you, you look at the sweep of Scripture just how important uh, words are. They matter. We know that. Uh, and one of my reflections as I thought about this was how terrible to be without words. As, as I think about our youngest's struggles in life, of which there are many, the inability to be able to communicate, the frustration of not being able to use language uh, because of her level of her learning disability, to, to, to communicate um, is uh, one of the most profound challenges and draws the deepest frustrations for her. So we tackle a topic uh, of the most... Uh, uh, extraordinary significance, our words and what we do with them. I'm going to do this in two halves. Um, th th this first talk this morning is going to be slightly more theory, um, principles, practice, uh, prin prin principles and problems uh, that exist with our speaking. Um, and then in the, in the final session of the day, I'm going to try and be much more practical. Um, and consider some of the specific contexts where we're called upon to speak well um, and how we can do that. So, first up, um, three principles. Uh, first, our words have extraordinary power. Um, I'm reliably informed that a thoroughbred horse uh, weighs about 450 kilograms. The bit that you put in its mouth, if you happen to be a horse rider, is five inches uh, uh, long. Just five inches. 450 kilograms. The Titanic weighed 46,000 tons. Uh, the rudder that steered it, just 15 feet long. That, James tells us, is the significance of the tongue. So small, such a little bit of our body. Never weighed the tongue, and I never measured it either, now I come to think about it. Uh, but it's not big. But James's point here in uh, these uh, famous verses in chapter 3 uh, is that it is phenomenally powerful, capable of the most extraordinary impact. The power of the tongue... Proverbs tells us is nothing less than the power of life and death. So, so we may say, sticks and stones, they break my bones, but words will never hurt me, and it is absolutely not true. Is it? All of us have been hurt by words at some point or other in our lives. One word, inadequate written down in an Ofsted report was enough to set in train a sequence that led to Ruth Perry's suicide. In another context, just one word, yes, may at some point in your life have told you or will in the future tell you that the love of your life is going to spend the rest of her life with you. Will you marry me? Yes. One word. Life-changing significance. Words are powerful. Because they are the means by which we connect with one another. 
through our words, we make ourselves known. Through our words, we reveal ourselves. Uh, God does the same. It is by his word, by him revealing himself, that we know him. And we do likewise. Because we want to know and be known. There's something in us, there's something about the way that God has made us that, that desires to know and be known. And our words are the means by which we accomplish that. Without words, without relationship, well, it would be like a living death. So every day, 10 or 20,000 of these extraordinarily powerful words pass our lips. Each one capable of doing tremendous good, bringing encouragement, hope, peace, unity, instruction, wisdom, joy to another person or each of those words capable of doing terrible harm, bringing malice, division, contempt, jealousy, slander, and pain. Today's topic couldn't be more important, could it? The words, how we do them, how we talk. Uh, words are extraordinarily powerful. Uh, second, our words are an overflow of our hearts. And that's what Jesus is telling us here um, in these uh, words from Luke 6. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. The, 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 the language literally here is, is capturing the idea of an overflow. Um, same word is used of the... Uh, of, of the bread that is left over and needs to be sort of collected up uh, after the feeding of the multitude. There's an overflow of it. Well, out of the heart, our words overflow, spills out. Whatever our hearts are filled up with, well, have an overflow from that out of our mouths, spill words. Words then are like the clothes of our thoughts. They reveal the passions that rule us. And, and all of that means that mere willpower alone, just, just a little bit of self-control, won't hack it in terms of getting a handle on our words. You won't do it just by trying harder. No, because our, our thoughts and our desires will keep overflowing. They'll slip past our efforts um, to get our words right. Now, any transformation of our speech will only come about through a transformation of our hearts. And we'll think more about that later in the day. But it, it does mean, doesn't it, that, that one, one really crucial measure of our growth in godliness... One way of telling how much our conforming to the likeness of Jesus Christ has taken place is by what's your speech like? Because they're an overflow of your heart. So what you end up saying is a way of revealing what's going on in your heart, for good or for ill. Our words are phenomenally powerful. Our words are an overflow of our hearts. Uh, and then third, um, our words are to be shaped by love. Um, if, if after um, uh, having had that reading, you were hoping for an exposition of Ephesians 4, I'm sorry to disappoint you. Um, we're just going to dip into it briefly because uh, I'm dotting around in lots of places and we're going to come to Proverbs in a minute. But, but, but pause for a moment um, on that, that final paragraph in Ephesians 4 that uh, we just listened to, where you, you'll notice there's a, there's a sort of before and after picture, isn't there? Did you catch that there? Um, that there's a, that Paul, Paul likes to do this from place to place. He likes to provide this sort of, you know, kind of before um, God is at work. It looks like this. Once God has worked, it looks like this. It's sort of before and after picture. And you catch it there. The before picture in, in verse 14 is a picture of immaturity. 
uh, infants. It's a picture of instability blown to and fro, tossed about by the waves. And it's a picture of gullibility uh, blown here and there by every wind of teaching, um, by the cunning and craftiness of people and the deceitful scheming. Um, Immaturity, instability, gullibility. And then the after picture um, that's tucked in there in verses 15 and 16 is a picture of maturity. Uh, A body, strong, uh, with all that sense of of stability uh, and security uh, that comes with it. And and what's the link? How do do you get from the immaturity to the maturity, from the unstable to the stable? What's Paul's link in these verses? Well, it's there at the beginning of verse 15. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. Here's how you do it. Here's how a church does it, because these are words addressed to a church. Here's how your church is going to do it. If your church is going to become mature, then central to that process will be speaking the truth in love to one another. Not, not just somebody preaching good sermons from the front. Not just all of you in your church going home and reading your Bibles at home. Important though both of those things are. There's another bit. And that other bit is speaking the truth in love to one another. Being a community of people, all of whom sense that they have a responsibility to bring the truth of God's Word, the counsel to be found in God's Word, to one another. That's the cultural shift Um, that I'm persuaded and that BCUK as an organisation loves to talk about and loves to try and communicate the transformation that's needed in our churches. That we become a community of people capable of, increasingly capable of, increasingly skilled at speaking the truth in love uh, to one another. But that is a profoundly misunderstood phrase, isn't it? I mean, isn't that your experience? I mean, if somebody taps you on the shoulder and says, you know, my brother, I need to speak the truth in love to you, you sit down. You know, you, you sort of tense. You, know, you, you have a sense that, you know, um, this is going to hurt, but it's going to be good for you, um, is, is the sort of tone of voice that, that this speaking the truth in love is coming at you. You know, it's... Here's something that someone's really wanted to say to you for a long, long time, and now you're going to get it both barrels. That's how we understand the phrase. I don't know why. It doesn't seem to me that that's what the phrase means. Why should speaking the truth in love refer simply to to correction and rebuke? Why, Why wouldn't you be speaking the truth in love where you offer comfort, loving, truthful comfort, of all that God is to you, to a person in great distress. Why why wouldn't it be speaking the truth in love when you speak hope, truthful hope, to somebody who is feeling despairing? Why wouldn't it be speaking the truth in love when you, you remind somebody of the promises of God for them, the grace poured out to them in the gospel? that that's the way that you love them as you speak that truth to them. I don't know why we've done such damage to this phrase. It's a much bigger idea than than, than we tend to, to, to reduce it to. It's any communication of the truth that God has revealed to us, spoken lovingly to another person in all the different contexts. And that, Paul says here, That's what brings us from immaturity to maturity. That's what we need in our churches. Speech that, that in a a sense, says, I'm I'm working out what would be most loving to say to you. Having listened to you, having understood you, having worked out what's going on in your life, I, I then think, what words would bless you? What words would help you? What words would be good for you? How often our conversations are a million miles away from that. Uh, I've, I've heard most of our conversations described as an exercise in overlapping monologues. I mean, you, you know, and, and we all do it. You know, if in the coffee break later on you tell me about your most recent holiday, 
and I think, oh, holidays. So I tell you about my most recent holiday. Um, and in doing so, I mention our car breaking down. So you tell me about the last time your car broke down. And in that, you mention that the man who came in the breakdown truck had a Scottish accent. And I think Scotland. We've got a friend who lives in Scotland. So I tell you about my friend Ian who lives in Inverness. And you think, oh, Scotland, salmon. So you tell me that you quite like smoked salmon. <laughs> and, and we've just had this little series of overlapping monologues. Now, neither of us have really been listening to other beyond the fact that we're just listening for a, a hook to deliver our next monologue on. So many of our conversations are just like that. Instead of actually listening, instead of being the person who changes the dynamic by saying, now I'm going to ask questions, now I'm going to be really interested, and I'm going to ask you to tell me more. And you ask the next question that means that instead of sort of working up here at the very superficial sort of monologue, 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 that the next question pushes things a little bit more deeper, a little bit more interested in you, because I'm asking you questions and drawing you out. And now you're willing to talk because you think this person seems interested in me. Very different kind of conversation that, isn't it? Love does things differently. Love listens, and when it does speak, it speaks for the benefit of the other with words that bless. And such a conversation builds God's church. So three reasons uh, why today's topic couldn't be more important. Words are powerful. Words reveal the overflow of our hearts. And our words are to be shaped by love. But our topic may be tremendously important, but that doesn't make it easy, does it? Speaking well is hard. So, so let me briefly consider five problem areas in our speaking. They all come from verses um, in the Proverbs, um, which, as you know, has masses to say about this. Probably after the things that Proverbs has to say about wisdom, the things it has to say about speech are the next biggest um, uh, in the book. Uh, one writer, Paul Tripp, um, reckons that a good summary of Proverbs would be, words give life, words bring death, you choose. Uh, here's five. Um, five problem areas. First, words that lie and deceive. The Lord detests lying lips, but he delights in people who are trustworthy. It's such a key area, isn't it? I mean, it's sort of obvious, but recognize that lying lips include deceit or disguising or clouding the truth. And the reason that, that any of that matters is because of the damage that lies do to relationships. In the presence of deceit, relationship becomes impossible. Uh, years ago, I was involved with a couple where, um, where it became clear that one of the two in this marriage had been deceiving the other at a profound way for years. I mean, in an extraordinary way, um, down to the fact that they had been claiming to be in a job that they weren't actually in. Uh, this person came to meet me in a car that he had borrowed for a test drive as part of his deceit of me about who he was and his level of wealth. It's an extraordinary kind of level of deceit. Now, you can imagine, how could a marriage exist when that level of deceit is going on? Okay, that's an extreme example, but, but tone it back a bit. And even lesser levels of massaging the truth, not revealing things fully, how that undermines a relationship makes it impossible to engage because trust is gone.
when we can't be sure that we're hearing the truth from another person, we have no basis on which to really do relationship with them. And of course, these things are a, are a spiritual issue. The devil is the father of lies lying from the beginning, Jesus tells us. And just allowing misunderstanding to exist in another person, that's deceiving them. Uh, first, lying words. Uh, second, arrogant words. The Tower of Babel is fascinating, isn't it? Um, you think about the Tower of Babel much. Um, there, there it is, this, this assault on heaven. We'll build a tower so that we make a name for ourselves, the people said. There's an arrogance there. We're going to do it. We're going to assault heaven. Uh, we're going to build. We're going to be important. And God's response to that? Fascinatingly, it is to bring a confusion of language. To, to, to separate the people by no longer allowing them to have the same language together. More fascinating still, when you stop and think about it, is when that confusion of language gets reversed on the day of Pentecost. When suddenly people from all nations, with all sorts of different languages, can suddenly understand one another. Isn't that fascinating? What God is doing there with words... He interrupts the arrogant speech with the presumption to build a tower for a name for themselves, but he facilitates the gracious speech that will build his church to the glory of Jesus Christ. So, so what are we to avoid? Well, we're to avoid boasting, sure. How about also avoiding practicing our righteousness before others? Jesus warns us about that, doesn't he? Don't practice your righteousness before others to be seen by them. That, that's another form of arrogance and boasting, isn't it? Parading our righteousness. Yeah, but, but how about this one? How about grumbling? You pop grumbling in this category? What's that doing? Category of arrogance. Grumbling? Uh, only there is an arrogance there, isn't there? Because when we grumble, particularly when we grumble against God... Kind of what we're really saying is, I know better. I know how this should have happened. I grumble that God has given me this situation, this church, this pastor. Grumble. I, I know it would be better, my plan, better than his. There's an arrogance tucked into that. Third, harsh words. Harsh is the opposite of loving. Uh, these are words that hurt and wound. Uh, Proverbs 12, 18 says, The words of the reckless pierce like swords. Harsh words are like a sword stroke. They cut a person. Pierce their very heart sometimes. And the damage is not easily undone. I hate you. I wish I'd never married you. Words like that can create a fault line in a marriage that you can never undo. Or, or words spoken to a child. Don't be such a baby. You're so clumsy. Why can't you be more like your sister? It's just lazy. Harsh words like that shape a child. Sets in their hearts a view of themselves that they may never shake off. Uh, close to harsh words are hasty words. See someone who speaks in haste? Uh, uh, Proverbs 29 says, See someone who speaks in haste, there is more hope for a fool than them. Words spoken <clears throat> in the heat of the moment. Words spoken without weighing their wisdom. A reckless tweet. An email blasted back. It's easy to be harsh when you're not face to face, isn't it? James uh, 1 um, talks about the need to keep a tight rein on our tongues. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a, a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Uh, the hymn writer John Newton 
speaking on this verse, says, If the tongue is frequently without a bridle, if it may be observed that a person often speaks lightly of God and of divine things, proudly of himself, harshly of his fellow creatures, if it can be affirmed with truth that he's a liar, a talebearer, a railer, a flatterer, or a jester, then whatever other good qualities he may seem to possess, his speech betrayeth him. He deceiveth himself. His religion is vain. Is that your pitfall? Your words too hasty? Or are there just too many of them? Is it excessive words? The prudent, Proverbs say, holds their tongues. But do you just speak too many? Are your words just a, just a flow? No space for others to talk? Not when you're in the room. No listening, just talking. The prudent hold their tongues. But on the other hand, if it's not going to make this too complicated, on the other hand, holding your tongue a bit too much, that's a problem too. Fifth problem, absent words. And, and speaking about absent words, I have in mind both the tendency and the treatment. The tendency is that some people just seem to be permanently lacking in words. Their verbal output isn't 10 or 20,000. It feels as though it might be 10 or 20. They just don't have things to say. What would you like to eat tonight? Don't mind. Should we go out? Don't know. What are you reading? Nothing. Will you be free the weekend? Maybe. It's like, it's like blood from the proverbial stone. And, and if you're married to a proverbial stone, it's not much fun. Because words mean connection. Through our words, we make ourselves known. We give people access to our hearts. But if the overflow from the heart is blocked, then connection is blocked too. People with persistently minimal or absent words, whether they realise it or not, are shutting others out, isolating themselves. So that's the, the tendency. But then there's another kind of absent words, which is the treatment, by which I have in mind the silent treatment, when crossness leads to silence. An absence of words that is more punishment than habit. And with the silent treatment, if you've ever had it done to you, or if, like me, you can remember times in life when you've done it, to my shame, well, what are you doing there? You're putting the other person to death. That's what you're doing. You're murdering them. Because you're acting like they're not even there. It's one of the harshest and angriest things a person can do. Five problems. Lying words, arrogant words, harsh words, hasty words, absent words. They're not the only problems we have with our words, but they'll do for a start. And my question is, as we wrap up this first session is, which is yours? Which of these problems are you most prone to? Do you know? If you don't, who could you ask to help you know what problem with your words you tend towards? It'd be important to know, wouldn't it? Because Jesus has this to say about the significance of our words. Everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. Now words matter. They can bring death. They can bring life. Plenty of reasons to choose our words very carefully. Now, through the rest of the day, in the seminars, um, uh, and in our final session together, um, we'll be thinking... How, what it looks like to talk well in a range of different circumstances. In identifying these problems, I'm wanting to say, look, beware, there are dragons ahead. This is dangerous territory. 
we ought to think more seriously, more carefully about our words. Let me return uh, with this final slide to, to, to our principles. Words are powerful. Give attention to your words. They really matter. Words reflect our hearts. So give more attention to your heart. What it's loving, what it's desiring. Uh, one of the big threads in our training with BCUK is finding ways to say, what is really ruling my heart? I, we know what's supposed to rule our hearts. We know that we're committed to Christ. We know that the Lord Jesus is the Lord of our lives and, and our hearts are given over to him. We know that's what we're supposed to say. But functionally, in reality, day by day in the detail, what actually takes control? Is it the, the love of people's approval? Is it the love of being in control? Is it the love of possessions and wealth? What is it that takes control of your heart most easily? When you're in free fall, when you're just sort of idly letting your mind drift, what does it drift towards? That'll tell you what the functional God that you have tends to be. And knowing that helps us to bring it to the Lord and seek for change from that. So words are powerful. Words reflect our hearts and words uh, need to be shaped by love so that we give more attention to Christ, to the one that we need to meet us uh, in our need, but also the one whose pattern we want to follow. Every word that Jesus spoke was beautiful, wasn't it? Do you read the Gospels and you think, Genius. How did he think to say that just then, in that way? People were amazed again and again at his words. They, he, people were silenced because they heard him say things and they thought, oh, I'm not going to ask him any more questions. This is, this is brilliant. Wouldn't it be lovely to be like him? Speak the way that he does? The Lord God, if you're a Christian believer, the Lord God is conforming you to the image of Christ that you would be somebody who speaks like him. What a precious prospect. Yearn for it, pray for it, long for it. Let me pray for us. Uh, our Lord God, we thank you for uh, Christ. Uh, thank you for one who spoke perfect words at every moment. Uh, no word out of place. Uh, no word spoken out of self-interest only ever uh, spoken in obedience to you, seeking to bring glory to you, his heavenly Father. Uh, thank you that in him we see um, what it is uh, to, to be people living rightly. Uh, Lord, how we long that you might be at work uh, to bring about the transformation of our hearts. That would mean that the overflow that comes out of them uh, is good. Uh, and we pray that today uh, might serve uh, that end. That the things we, we hear in the sessions that we're going to be in, the things that we hear, and indeed the things that we say in all of the conversations, uh, that these things would be pleasing to you as well. And we ask you in Christ's name. Amen. Well, it's, uh, it would be good to avoid those uh, overlapping monologues over tea and coffee, wouldn't it? And uh, so here's uh, on the screens a great question to ask uh, over that, hopefully. So uh, which of the five problems are you most tempted towards? If you, if you say it first, then you don't have to answer. So that's, that's the challenge, to get, get in there first. Um, but before we, uh, we close, we're going to sing again uh, and... Uh, we want the Lord to own and reign supreme in every aspect of our lives, don't we, including our conversations. So let's uh, uh, sing to one another and to the Lord.
please do take seats. It's wonderful to have uh, 10 of those with us, great resources uh, for us. Stephen's going to come and tell us a few of those he's got on offer. Good morning. Good morning. That singing is awesome. Thank you for blessing us with that singing. Thank you. So, um, my name's Stephen. I've come from Morecambe up in uh, sunny Lancashire. We even have sunshine up there today, aren't we? Aren't we blessed? Uh, there's been a bit of a change around at 10 of those towers this week. Uh, the person who's supposed to be here is now in Exeter because the person who's supposed to be in Exeter stuck in Brazil because it's absolutely heaving it down over in Brazil. So here's a reference for you. Like Nigel Spink was summoned from the bench in the 1982 European Cup final because Jimmy Rimmer was injured, so I've been summoned from the bench to come and share. Anybody get that reference? Yeah, 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 I worked hard on that one. Um, maybe there's more blue noses than I expected. Um, but words matter. Words, what we say matters. Words, what we read matters too. So we, we are proud at 10 of those to bring you books, books that point to Jesus because we believe they change lives. And wonderful to hear from Steve already, how he's been challenged us about the use of words. And we've got several of Steve's books, one of them, The Heart of Anger. So if you want to read more about it, I'm sure what Steve will talk about later on as well. Uh, take away the heart of anger. This will be normally 13, but we're selling this for nine. We've also got Steve and Helen Thorne's handbook on mental health and your church available for eight pounds. So do have a look at those. Another book um, on a similar idea about how we support one another is this book by Ed Welch, Edward Welch, Side by Side. Now we as men, we've spent a lot of time side by side, don't we? We're side by side here. We're side by side, maybe watching the footy. We're side by side in the car. We're side by side doing jobs around church. But when we're side by side, what should we be? Now, my wife's read this. She said it's a wonderful book about being a, being a real friend. It reminds us that we are needy. We are needy people, but we are needed as well. So this book's a wonderful book to think about, maybe more deeply about putting into place some of the things you've been thinking about today. So that's side by side. That's eight pound. Now, what we've done today, if you're thinking, oh, so many books, I just don't know what to buy. Well, what we do if you're in that position is we put together a book pack. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we've put together a book pack. And uh, in the book pack, we've got the following books. The, the, all, this is normally 24, but they're all, they're all for three for £10. The first one is how to talk about Jesus without looking like an idiot. I think the worst thing for a man is to look like an idiot. We really don't want that, do we? Really don't want that. And Andy Bannister, when he was young, he writes about how he was a classic Christian, just hated the idea that anybody would find out that he was a Christian. But now he goes and encourages people around the world to be evangelists, to be more evangelistic. So he takes us on a journey, exposes our fears and our idols, gives us practical ideas in a really funny way to help us to encourage us to share our faith without looking like an idiot. So that's one of the books in there. We've also got Visible Grace, a short book. And if you want to buy this for your church, we'll do you a hundred for a pound a piece. So take it away, show it your pastor. Perhaps it might be something you buy. And this is such a reminder, when we're in church tomorrow, I'm a pastor, so I know where everyone in our church will sit because they always sit in the same place. But what does it mean to be sat next to that person you sat next to? Who are they? Who are they? This reminds us that those people are important to Jesus and they're important to us. Really easy to read book, a really powerful one, that's Visible Grace. And lastly, last on God's list, and um, it's important we believe passionately about biography, stories about people transformed by Jesus, encourage us and spur us on, don't they? And it's important to have fresh ones of these. We can't keep reading about Corrie ten Boom. There's nothing wrong with that, but we need fresh stories. And last on God's list is the story of Jason Armstrong, who really, in many people's eyes, really would have been right at the bottom. Abused by his family, words really, truly hurt him, and he, would, he made bad decisions in his life, but Jesus transformed his life, so much so that he's now a church warden. But more than that, now he's saved by grace and a wonderful ex expression of God's grace in his life. That's last on God's list. So those, those books, and you've also got that, not just as a book, but you can also have it as a track to give away to a pal. So all those books, normally 24, they're ten pounds. We've got quite a few books that some of the speakers are going to be speaking about in the seminars. If you can't find them, come and ask me. We, if we haven't got them, we can hopefully order them for you. But we'll do our best to serve you. Oh, and if you'll come today, and maybe 
Maybe you've had some words going, I can't believe you're leaving with the kids all day. Well, take back a book for the kids. Um, Say What is our wonderful gospel presentation. My daughter's just finished school. She's 18. But I remember the days when we used to read books and read the rhymes together. They were special times. These books are just right for that age group. So the young, young children, preschoolers, early primary schoolers. Wonderful pictures, really simple rhymes, but point them to the gospel of Christ. I finished. Time for coffee, hopefully. Is it Leo? Where are we at? Yeah. Thank you, Leo, for your time. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, tea and coffee and refreshments are served. They're going to be in the Easter Hall, um, so round through uh, through the foyer to the right. And then after that, we've got workshops. Uh, the location sh should be uh, on the screen, um, so where you need to go for those. And just to remind you, um, and then we've got the refresh session after lunch, and all the timings are in the front of the book. So if you need to know where you need to be when, uh, look in the front of the booklet. But tea and coffee is now served.